Hello now, and welcome to this evening's virtual event with author Haley Neal to celebrate the launch of Once More with Chutzpah in conversation with Jean Meltzer. My name is Rachel and I'm a bookseller at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you're familiar with our store and our event series, it's wonderful to have you back. And if this is your first time with us, welcome. We're truly so happy to have all of you here with us tonight and really appreciate your support of an independent bookstore and authors by participating in events such as this and through your book purchases. Now this evening, we're thrilled to have Haley and Jean with us. Haley Neal is a recent MFA grad from the New School, where she specialized in writing for children and young adults. She previously obtained her master's in education while working full-time as a preschool teacher. She loves school, teaching, and going to school to learn about teaching, as well as walking her rescue pup through her Massachusetts town and pretending she's on a home baking show. And when she's not writing or walking her puppy, or pretending she's on a home baking show, <laughs> you can find her working for a library's children's department. This is her debut and we could not be more excited to be celebrating once more with chutzpah with her tonight. Now, moderator Jean Meltzer studied dramatic writing at NYU Tisch and has earned numerous awards for her work in television, including a daytime Emmy for Outstanding Children's Series category. She spent five years in rabbinical school before her chronic illness forced her with forced her to withdraw. And her father told her she should write a book at that point, but not a Jewish one because no one reads those, <laughs> of course. <laughs> the Matzah Ball is her first novel. This evening, Haley and Jean will be sharing conversation about Once More with Chutzpah. When high school senior Tally and her twin brother Max travel on an exchange trip to Israel, questions about Jewish identity, mental health struggles, and sexuality build and build it becomes clear that this journey to a new place is also a journey to understanding herself. And Tally must grapple not only with the past, but also with what life will look like when they return home. It is a true honor to have Haley and Jean here with us tonight. Please join me now in welcoming them both. Oh my gosh. Hello. Oh, Hi everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. So let me, let me just begin and tell you, Haley, that I absolutely I'm gonna grab it because I want it close to my heart. I adored Once More with Chutzpah. I cried more than once. I related to this character, I think more than I have in any other YA book I've ever read. Um, I will not give anything away, no spoilers, but there is a twist in this book, which was so brilliant that in that moment, I thought to myself, I will buy every book that you write going forward, because for you to be able to do that in your debut speaks to your, your incredible talent. And I am just so excited and honored to be here to celebrate you. So thank you so much for asking me to do this. And it is beyond my honor and pleasure. Everybody, if you have not read this yet, go out, buy a copy, buy it for your friends, buy it for any Jewish teenager you know, anyone who's gone to Israel, Jewish professionals, definitely get it for your Hebrew high school classes. This book is one of a kind and it's a book we have needed on our shelves for a very long time. So thank you, Haley, for writing it. And now I'm gonna start grilling you, if that's okay. <laughs> I before the webinar officially started that I have in fact recently reread the book. So <laughs> I'm ready to talk about it. <laughs> All right, I would I would hope you like know everything already because your character is so lifelike to me. Uh, so tell, for those at home who might not know, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Once More with Chutzpah and what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, of course. So uh, Once More with Chutzpah is about Tally and her twin brother Max as they set off on a temple uh, exchange trip over their winter break, their senior year of high school. Um, Tally thinks this is going to be the perfect distraction for Max, who's been struggling in the wake of a car accident that injured him and killed the driver. And Tally's like, this is going to fix him. She's using language that's maybe not um, ideal. She's using language like fix and broken, which is very purposeful for things that happen later in the story. Um, she's like, this is going to fix him. This is going to help him. We're going to go on this trip. It's going to make everything better. And she really has no idea to start off with how much it's going to mean to her too. 
Um, I was inspired to write this actually after my own trip to Israel, which is where my grandma's from. Um, Safta, if you figured out how to log on, hi, and I love you. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I went on this trip and the, the book was particularly inspired by the experience of going to the Western Wall and the Jerusalem Pride Parade on the same day. And for those of you who don't know, when you go to the Western Wall, the tradition is that you write a prayer and you put it in the wall. And that is uh, seen as a part of yourself. It's seen as a part of your soul. It, it goes directly to God. So much so that it, it the pieces of paper are given a proper Jewish burial. This is something that is very meaningful. And when I went, I was kind of expecting that connection. And instead I, I got a little, I got a little angry. I don't know if I, anyone else had this experience when you first go and you see the fact that there's this big men's section and this small women's section at the Western wall. I just kind of was like, oh, I don't know how to deal with that. I, I was really surprised. I was really surprised because I had heard a lot about this. I had known this was a place people make pilgrimages to. This is a place that you're supposed to visit and you're supposed to feel connected to. And it seemed to represent to me how, how much progress we still we still need, how far we still need to go. Just in general, I, I was seeing it, you know, the ideas building of like everything we could still work on to change. And then I found out that there is a section that is gender neutral. It is outside of the security. And you almost have to walk through, it looked like an archeological archaeological dig when I was there. And you get to this tiny little section and I burst into tears. I, I wasn't expecting it. I really, I, mean, I get all emotional every time I talk about it. So sorry, mm -hmm. um, I just burst into tears because all of a sudden it was this moment of coming face to face with, with hope almost, with, with hope for change. Um, because even though it was this tiny little section and even though it was outside of the security, it wasn't, you know, I guess, officially recognized, it was there. Um, and the fact that it was there seemed to me to represent this idea that, you know, we can do better. We, we can keep trying. We can keep trying to do better and listen to people and recognize things that are going on. Um, so I wrote my prayer and I wrote it as a letter and I folded it up and I put it in the wall and I was like, you know, oh, I don't know. I, I can't take a picture with myself there. I, I wasn't sure about it. So I took a picture of the letter. And then later I saw that the only thing you could see from my picture, from my letter was the sign off, which was love comma. And it was, it was so powerful. It was so powerful to me. And it, it stayed with me even after I was home, just this idea of, of that hope and that progress and that love continue that love without a full stop without a, without an end um and that, that was the beginning of once more with Hutza. that that's where it all started wow. i love that that is so beautiful and you know i really relate to it myself too because one of the themes i write about a lot is this idea of brokenness and not to go all rabbinical student on you here but you know the sages repeatedly tell us that without the reason for brokenness is that it leads to repair and that this idea that we are always striving to be better. Um, I, one of the things too, when I was reading your book, I was reminded of this quote. I even wrote it in my pages of notes I took for this because um, I loved your book so much and I wanted to remember everything. But I wrote in very big letters this quote um, from Andrew Solomon, which is, we give to others what we need. And I thought that Tally's journey, Tally's journey was so much about giving what she needed almost to others. So fixing the brokenness. I mean, you know, I, I love everything you said in your journey um, to get there. So Tally's Jewish, but in addition to being Jewish, again, I'm going to like swoon a little, get the clamped on your book. But um, you, to me, what I love about this book is sometimes I read YA and, you know, the characters are very self-assured and they're very strong and they, they say all the right things and they're totally cool. And that was not my experience as a teenager, right? I was a mess. I was confused. The whole world was sort of spinning around me and I was sort of lost. I didn't know what was going on. And it was a, when I look back at my youth, I, I was terribly confused about many, many different things. 
So Tally's Jewish, but she's also experiencing sort of these mental health issues. She's exploring her sexual identity, her Jewish identity, um, grief, all these various issues going on in her life. So why was it important to you to write a story that explored all these various identities for her? Yeah, it, you know, a lot of where Tally started from is very personal. So, so much of that came from myself, came from myself as a, as a teenager. But even though that this, a lot of it was drawn from a lot of a, a personal place from identity, Tally totally took on this personality of her own um, in such surprising and unique ways. I started wanting to show all of those identities because I, I hadn't seen them. I hadn't seen them. And it was one of those things where I was like, you know what? I know how much it would have meant to me as a teenager to see that. I know how much it would have meant to me even as a young adult seeing that. And I really wanted to show her and all of her complicated mess and, you know, all of her full glory. One thing that I love when I'm reading books is I, I love when you see a character who feels complete, who feels full. Mm -hmm. And full and complete people have so much going on in their lives. They are never just one thing. Um, and so that that's why I think everything kind of ended up intersecting. Why, you know, yes, she's struggling with anxiety and she's struggling with other things with her mental health and and she's struggling with her Jewish identity. And, and it all coexists because, I mean, that, that's the way it is. We're, we're all dealing with so much on so many different layers. Um, it's a fun challenge to write that. <laughs> Certainly is. There, there were a lot of drafts of this book that happened to, to get us. <laughs> I really, when I read it, that as another writer, right? Someone I've been writing my entire life. That was my thought. I was like, how did she pull this off? Because normally you would think, tackling all those issues in a book would be a jumbled mess. But you, it, it really felt like a full flesh and blood character. It felt so, she felt so real that you almost wanted to like reach in the pages and like hug her and be like, everything's going to be okay. You're going to figure it out one day. You're just in the process. You don't you know? <laughs> I kept yeah. saying as I was writing, like, I feel like I need to bake my character cookies. I've put her through a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. but, but it's also so honest to like the experience of being a teenager. And just like you said, I related a story to you about a friend of mine who's an openly gay rabbi. And we were talking about the change in publishing and like, we talked about Red, White, and Blue by Casey McClendon. Quit because someone had, oh, you have it. <laughs> and someone had given him the book and he was saying to me, you know, Gene, like my life would have been so different if I was a teenager and someone had handed me this book. And I felt that way about your book and the thought that it's going to be on the shelves for, for Jews, non-Jews, people of various sexual aspects and people suffering with grief, anxiety disorders, whatever it is, they're going to see themselves in your pages. And I absolutely just am so grateful that you have put so much of your vulnerability and heart on the page. Um, so we, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you cry, but I got a whole 45 minutes here to talk about how amazing you are. So I get to swoon, I get to be the fangirl. So let me fangirl. <laughs> um, so there's a ton of these very serious topics which you've handled beautifully, but it would be totally wrong of us to say that your book is all dark. Like, like breaking the glass at the end of the wedding, we temper our sadness with lots of joy in your book, right? So um, tell me about the lighthearted elements. Why was that important to you to bring humor, to bring travel, to bring escapism, all the amazing Israel scenes. Guys, if you've ever been to Israel on one of these guided tours, you will, it is hilarious. You will like laugh out loud, recognize everything, so tell me more about the development of that. Did you go back to Israel? Did you do more research? How did you get so, I mean, it, I felt like I was reading a tour guide like book at points because you, you've got as someone who's lived there for two years and been to Israel back and forth multiple times. You got it perfectly. Perfect. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. First of all, <laughs> um, I... The funny thing is the research that I did later, a lot of it actually came down to the musical elements. Oh, interesting. We'll get into yeah. <laughs> um, I'm really lucky to have uh, Israeli family who talked to me as I was writing this oh, yeah. and talk 
walked through some of this, I was able to go back to pictures. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, writing and revising happened during the pandemic. Um, so travel was not um, necessarily an option, which <laughs> Actually, did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, really, I really do want to go back and I would love to go back um, in particular with my Safta uh, who's who grew up there. Um, yes, so <laughs> getting those elements, a lot of it came down to the fact that I kind of started writing pretty immediately after my trip. Um, mm. I was honoring all of these joyous memories that I had. A lot of that first draft really came down to the, the trip elements before the characters were really fully fleshed out. So for that, that definitely started that uh, I started with my setting and with my trip and sort of with the structure of that. And then the characters kept growing and I had to do different areas of research and studying. Uh, I remember actually, so uh, for those who haven't read yet, my uh, main character Tally uh, is a, a hopeful Broadway lyricist. She absolutely loves musicals. And that was something that came in while I was working and developing the story. I was probably partway through the first draft when that happened. And I remember having this like mo aha moment. I was like working out at Planet Fitness of all places. <laughs> this is what she does. Like, this is Tally. This is her, <laughs> her hopes and her dreams. Um, so I ended up sort of doing a deep dive into those elements. Uh, I love musicals myself, but probably not as much as my character does, which is the only thing to say. Uh, so I was living in New York while I was working that working on the first few drafts. And uh, this was before the pandemic started. I was really lucky to get to go to so many shows. I rushed so many shows so I could sit in and, and watch them and experience it and um, kind of tap into this thing that Tally loves. <laughs> uh, and that really helped inform her as a character and inform those elements of the story. Um, as for just the, the fact that there are serious topics as well as lighthearted topics, I am a firm believer. I, I've said this before, I'm gonna say it again. I'm a firm believer in the marriage of heart and humor to tell a complete story. You know, we can't have those light moments without those dark moments. And there is a Jewish folklore that is actually mentioned in this. And um, one of my friends uh, who is actually one of my early readers, uh, Nadia, thank you so much if you're listening, hi. <laughs> uh, ended up telling me the story and I thought it was so beautiful that I had to include it about this town that has everything that they could ever want, um, except their food doesn't have any flavor. So they start crying into their food because the salt would bring the flavor. The tears brought that flavor to life. And I think that's such a good way of looking at it and looking at Tally's journey in general. You know, there's so many layers to what's going on with her that you need the light and, and the darkness and, and all of that it's gonna exist anyway. In real life, it exists all together, all jumbled up together. Um, and so it was, it was very important to me to show all of that. Um, I mentioned my Israeli family helping me a little bit. And so a funny note related to this was that um, my uncle Duty, I love you if you're watching, hi. <laughs> I'm gonna keep shouting out people. Um, he, one of the things he asked me, you know, Israelis are gonna be like, yeah, who's like, Tell, tell me like, why, why is this one character in here? You know, why is this character in here? And I was like, oh, well, actually I have an answer for that. I was like, well, mm -hmm. one of the reasons is comic relief. Like yeah. <laughs> a little bit of comic relief, yeah. but one of the reasons. <laughs> it's very Jewish to make yeah. light in the darkness. Yes. And uh... <laughs> it, it just, it goes together. I mean, it goes together in life. And so why not have it go together in a book? And I thought too, like you did these, I, so I also went on teen tours as well as like Israeli pilgrimages and things like that. And you captured like these great moments of like, for example, the way the teenagers move around on the plane, like, and like switch up seats. Like I was like, that's so true. That's exactly. And also having worked with lots of teens in my day now, you know, they, they absolutely do that. Or the awkwardness of the like um, Mifkash encounter with the Israeli, you know, and like that weird sort of like back and forth that goes when you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. I mean, you captured almost like these very 
nuanced, humorous moments of being like young Jewish and American and experiencing Israel. And I think it was so cool to see that, like to realize that it is this like fun, nuanced um, perspective that like is part of our worldview. And I think it's really, really cool to see it reflected on the page. I did not have books like this, obviously, growing up. Um, so that being said, I cannot, I will not leave here without asking you, what is your favorite musical? <laughs> Most important question, because I'm a Broadway wow. girl myself. <laughs> You've caught me in quite a moment. You've caught uh -huh. me quite a time. I guess uh, this is not unique because everyone's kind of experiencing it right now. I'm obsessed with Encanto. My family is going crazy because I keep, playing the music again and again and again and I'm sorry but I can't stop <laughs> um I yeah I'm having a bit of an <laughs> that's that's where we are uh thank you Disney <laughs> so what you're saying is I have not watched Encanto yet so what you're oh. saying is I need to as soon as this is over go watch it or oh, don't watch, watch it because I won't be able to write <laughs> I'll just do it <laughs> The fact that Disney was like, yeah, we're going to do a musical. It's a little bit about generational trauma I and the kids are going to love it. Yeah. Here's some bops. <laughs> Go watch it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I am, I'm a little bit obsessed right now. Uh, but I do want to talk about the fact that Waitress, the musical is such mm. an important one in the book. It's such mm. an important one for Tally. And that was very purposeful two reasons, I guess. Um, one is because the song she used to be mine is such a tally song. It's like, it perfectly captures so much of her. You know, she is messy, but she's kind. She is good, but she lies. Like she's trying, she's struggling. She's a complicated yeah. character. Um, I got to see it twice when I was in New York. It was amazing. And one of those times I got to go, uh, Sarah Bareilles, who actually, you know, wrote the songs was starring in it. Mm. It was an unbelievable experience. Wow. Um, so it was kind of, I, I honored it in the book. I honored it in the text. So I have to give a shout out to Waitress because that would normally be my answer. And I listened to that soundtrack so much writing this. Um, I also, all the chapter titles are uh, songs from uh, Broadway and movie musicals. Uh, some of them are, are Disney, so. <laughs> um, so. I, I, I had to, I had to talk about that. I had to, <laughs> we have to talk about that if we're talking about chutzpah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I had to give a shout out to waitress for, for sure. Cause it is an important one for Tally. I actually went and I started looking up based on like chapters of like the music and the songs. Cause I was like, I wonder what she was thinking. And like, especially some of the really moving scenes that you write, you know, I was very curious of like, like oh, where it came that? from. <laughs> family was family. Family was the chapter I went and I looked it up. I yeah. That one. Up. Funny you say that. Cause that's the one that the copy editor was like, okay, I have to, I have to ask, <laughs> you know, all of the other ones I could identify right away, but family, whenever I look up family in Broadway, it's all about family friendly musicals. She was like, yeah. song. So are you going to give us a Dream hint? Tell, us, <laughs> tell everybody where to go find it. It's Dream Girls. It's from Dream Girls. Dream it was Girls. so funny because that was the one that the copy editor was like, I keep saying family friendly musicals. Like what? Yeah. Is it? Um, yeah. That was a really fun thing to kind of figure out. And there's a lot of meaning to, if you pay attention, readers, eagle eyed readers are going to see, um, there's a lot of meaning between the ones that are referenced and then when it comes up for chapter titles, because there are musicals that are that are referenced as people performing in them, we're going to see them, and they they come up again, a lot of them as as chapter titles. So that was something I was working quite hard on. I was yeah. joking with my dad the other day that, you know, sometimes readers are like, oh, I wonder if the author meant this when they did. And I was like, sometimes you might be reading into things. And then sometimes it's me sitting there like, I'm going to intricately put all of this meaning into <laughs> I absolutely, I actually wrote it in my massive notes here about talking about how, because I'm a writer who likes to sort of layer to the layer, the metaphors. And I absolutely noticed you doing that. I, I totally got that. I, again, another reason I loved your book because 
you know, we have in Judaism what we call Pashat, the like simple layer, and then the Drash layer, which is like the deeper meaning. And I love that you could read your book over and over and over. You could come to it and you anybody can walk away. That's what I try to do in my book. Pashat layer, have a great time, feel something, you know, live your joy. But if you want to really sit there and dig, and which I love to do with books, yours is a great book to do it. You know, any book club out there would be would have a lot to talk about with uh, once more. Um, so aside from the fact that you have represented anxiety in this book and asexual uh, and demisexual on the A spectrum, which I did not know about, much about, um, and Judaism. Uh, so there's so many people here who could be seen in various forms. So. Uh, why was that important to you to give sort of voice to people who often we don't see in books? Yeah, I, you know, I was thinking a lot as I was writing this about the books that I had access to when I was younger, and especially in particular books about uh, Jewish identity. So much of it was just, it was centered on the Holocaust. And it is really tough to say to a reader, you know, or to say to a kid, you know, that we only care about your trauma. It, it, it got to the point where I refused, I refused to read them. I was like, you know what? I cannot do this. I can't take it. I can't take it anymore. And I really wanted to see a book that had Jewish joy, that had all those complicated, you know, layers to it. Um, and, and yeah, we, I say Jewish joy after we just talked about like all of these <laughs> things Tally's working on in the serious elements, but there, but there is a lot of joy in the story too. And so that was something I was really trying to work on it was something I wanted and there are so many great writers now there are so many more than you know what when I look at what the options were when I was younger you know there's there's this great book that people can read I don't know if anyone's read it there's this great one the mom's mom, you should have to check it out but there's there's so many stories you know I think about the stories by Marissa Cantor I think about the stories by Rachel and Solomon like think of these amazing authors who are showing all of this representation, who are showing all of this joy. And I, ju I just get so excited that, that readers have that. Yeah. Um, as for the other elements, you know, the, there are a lot of people writing, there's some great writers writing about anxiety too right now. Becky Albertalli is a great writer who is, who's tackling that for younger readers. And showing these mental health journeys is something that like is another thing I'm so excited people are, are talking about now are showing. And that was important to me too, because, you know, I didn't, I have certainly always been anxious. I did not always realize that it was mm, me. Interesting. That's interesting. <laughs> it's probably the best way to put it. My family could probably tell you that I've mm. always been anxious. Yeah. Um, but seeing, um, seeing different forms of that represented has definitely helped me as, as a person, as a reader. And I was definitely hoping that would help, help readers and help kids kind of see, oh, you know, hey, maybe I, I think like this and maybe I can ask for help. Maybe that's okay. Yeah. You know, maybe I'm not alone in this. As for the um, other elements, you know, I actually had an early reader reach out to me and say, I'm going to cry. I'm going to end up crying. I had an early reader reach out and say to me, you know, I, in terms of the asexual, demisexual representation saying like, I didn't realize like there were, there were words for this. Like, I think maybe this is what I am. And I think that from, from friends who I've talked to, from other people who uh, identify this way, I think that's something that happens you know this element of oh I didn't know there was a word for this and I felt like there's something wrong for a long time and maybe I felt like I needed to perform in a certain way um, maybe I felt like you know oh well I guess I'm just not gonna fit in in this way so I should I should act this way or I should I, I'm alone in it and being able to say hey there are words you know hey there are other people who feel this way and you are not alone was so was so important. And I mean, you know, I, I think when it comes to identity, it can be such a personal journey and it, it can be changing. You know, some people don't like labels, but my feeling is always that the reason a label can be very helpful is for people to know, hey, other people feel other people feel oh. this. Way. 
And so, so much of chutzpah is my way of saying to readers, you know, you're not alone. And also for readers who don't identify in those ways of saying, you know, this exists and other people are going through these things. And, you know, maybe you'll identify in it in one way or another with what's uh, what Tally and her friends are going through. And um, maybe it'll just uh, help with a little bit of empathy for, for those around you. Maybe you can get to see, Oh, you know what? Yeah. Other people are, are going through all of these various things in their lives. Um, Yeah. Maybe, maybe a little empathy for, for ourselves and for others. Mm. I love that. And I love also kind of going on this idea of like differences or diversity. Um, One of the things that's really wonderful about your book and, you know, it's interesting, you and I, I think we kind of, we have very different sort of Jewish backgrounds, right? So for me, I am a 100% DNA proven Ashkenazi Jew. I come from a Halakhic family. Um, The first time I went to Israel, you know, it for me, I, yeah, I had spent my life feeling almost in a public school too Jewish. So when I went to Israel, it felt like coming home, right? It was the first time I wasn't the odd man out, sort of, sort of. I wasn't the weirdo. Um, but it was so fascinating for me. And I was really grateful for the opportunity to read about an interfaith, uh, the child of an interfaith experience. And that it's not just her. Uh, across you, what you do a beautiful job of is sort of trying to pull in all sorts of uh, Jewish identities, Jewish perspectives, which is something I also try to do in my book. And I think you'll come to see, you know, not everybody realizes that the Jewish world is so varied in in beliefs and politics and and, uh, how we observe. And, um, you know, I joke, are you reformative or conservative? And then I always say, everybody's reconstructionist. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think what's so cool is that you, you show this diversity. So why why was this diversity in Judaism specifically important to showcase? Yeah, it was, that was very important to me to show because there is no one way to be Jewish. And for my particular background, you know, even within my family, we joke, me and my brother almost had completely different upbringings when it came to our faith um, and and our kind of connections to that. So I started off, I went to a temple preschool, you know, that was Mm. something that I, my childhood songs were things like five little hollows in the baker. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I have all these memories of Shabbat with, with my family and this, this connection to all of that. And as we grew older, um, you know, it, it was always, I would always say, you know, I'm interfaith. Whenever I was asked growing up, I would say, I I am interfaith because that's how I grew up. I grew up doing things like setting up the Christmas tree and making the latkes and, you know, drinking our eggnog and spinning the dreidel. We would just have this full, loving, beautiful celebration. Um, when the OC came out and they had Seth Cohen celebrating Christmas, I was like, that's me. Like, that's it. I love that. Um, and a lot of my friends were that way too. A lot of my friends had uh, families who were interfaith in, in different ways and it looked different. And as I got older, I started getting more and more connected to sort of my my Jewish faith and and my my cultural background in that way. And finding myself in that and finding that family connection felt so, it felt so important to me. But there were those struggles of feeling like, you know what, maybe I'm not enough in this, you know, maybe because of that background, I'm not going to be accepted in this way, you know maybe because I didn't do X, Y, Z, I don't count in this, in this Mm. place that I have family from, you know, that I, you know, that even though I, I, and I, and I, I'm struggling to say it because it's one of those things where it's like, I almost felt like I'd have to be like, oh no, I I have to prove I count. I have to prove I count in this space. I have to prove I fit with my family, you know, with my own background. And so there was that struggle of kind of getting to the point of accepting like, no, this is who you are. You know, this is, this is who you are. And we can all uh, learn and grow in our identities and our connections, you know, for my book launch celebration, I I had a little get together last night. Thank you. COVID testing. We were able to do it. Um, You know, I made homemade matzo ball soup 
you know, I, I, my recipe that I love making and I, I perfected my latkes this year <laughs> and I, you know, I made these foods that I have this cultural connection to and that I love and getting to the point of being like, yeah, I have a place here, you know, it, it meant a lot to me to sort of come to terms with that, that long struggle and then to recognize that everyone's connecting in such a different way. You know, everyone's seeing themselves as being not enough or, or too much, or, you know, kind of saying, where do I fit and where do I belong? Yeah. I really wanted to show on this trip that the teenager, well, the teenagers, first of all, they're teenagers. They're all going through this in such different ways and they're all connecting in such different ways. And that was so important to me, you know, there's a character who um, has Yemenite Jewish family. There's a, an Ethiopian Jewish character. There's a character who's more conservative than the rest of the, uh, the group. They kind of argue and disagree sometimes. Um, and that was so important to me because I don't think people realize that. I think if there's gonna be a non-Jewish reader picking this book up, they might be like, oh, there are different, there are different ways to be Jewish. There's different ways to connect. Like this is valid and that's also valid. Um, so yeah, it was really important. I'm sorry. I'm rambling on about no, it. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> I love listening to you. And I'll add on to that. It reminds me what you're saying of something. Sarah Hurwitz here all along. She writes about how Judaism is sort of this big table, right? And that we all sort of like a family Thanksgiving, a family Shabbat, you know, we have the cousin who thinks he knows everything and maybe the, the stepsister who hasn't been home for 50 years and, you know, the best friend. And but at the end of the day, that table, we're all family. And it doesn't matter if you've strayed. It doesn't matter if you don't know anything. And it doesn't matter. we're all part of this big Jewish family. And it's interesting because also I didn't want to really define movements and things because I felt like that was almost like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you believe or what you observe. If you are Jewish, you are Jewish, you know? So I, I love that. And one thing I will ask is, um, Tally's such a character that um, is struggling. She's really struggling. And so Ron, to me at least, came off as someone who was like very, very strong and understood who they were. And I, I want you, I would love for you to talk a little bit about that dichotomy and why you chose to make that character that way. And if, if you actually saw her that way, and just to talk a little more about that. I, lo I love that because um, she's, she's one of those characters. It's like, you know, you're not supposed to pick favorites or anything, but I, <laughs> I love Saran so much. Um, and she is strong. She's strong in her beliefs. She knows what she's doing in so many, so many ways. Um, one kind of, uh, I'm trying to think of how to, how to phrase this, but one thing that I was definitely thinking of is the way that this is a group trip. Mm. You can't necessarily get to know other people in as deep and a layered way as you would if you've known them for years. Yes. So we as readers get to know Tally in all of her mess very mm. clearly. Whereas a lot of the side characters, we definitely, we, we get to know, but we don't get to know on that same level just because yeah. of the, the way this trip works. Mm. So I love Saran because one of the things you see with her is almost first her performative layer. You know, you kind of see her being like strong and, and um, silly and, you know, coming up with nicknames and joking about fashion. And then you also get her working on her portfolio, you know, yeah. working on her application for schools and really trying to connect in this way where she's so passionate about it. She'll like go on about, about art. And she, she does know herself in this stronger way. And you, you do see it with their, with their interactions. Um, but that was something I was really trying to play with was that, you know, they, they're two characters coming from such, from such different places, uh, such different emotional places, such different, you know, everything. And you get to see them connect so quickly. Mm. You get to see the way that there's that play between them. Um, it's funny that you're that you're asking about this because one of my things I'm really working on in book two, which I don't know how much I can say about it, <laughs> but uh, I kind of joke that where Tally is like her whole journey is like, who am I? Like, where do I fit? You know, am I enough? My my character, my main character for my second book, like it's like, yeah, I know who I am, 
like, what does that mean? What does that mean now? Like, where do we go from here? Like, sure, I know who I am in practice. What's that about? (laughs) You know, it's interesting because too, when I talked about how you layer and as another writer, I I could see your layering. I put in my notes and one of the things I noticed was, you know, Tally is blocked, right? She can't, she's a lyricist who can't write. And so Ryan, very interesting as you're talking, she's sort of exploding with art, but it's not really very good art, right? It's, It's sort of like, it's being developed art, right? She's not got her, her. So it's sort of interesting that sort of mirroring you do, which I do as well, you know, in my writing. So, I mean, I just very much appreciated it. I love, you know, again, the nuances you can pick up in the book and um, as you're talking, just gaining more and more perspective that makes me even a bigger, bigger fan of yours. So let me ask then too, since you visited Israel, um, what was your favorite place to visit in Israel or one good memory that you'd like to share with everybody? Oh gosh. I mean, (laughs) my my sort of most important memory that really stayed with me was visiting the Western Wall. I I did also get to go to the Jerusalem Pride Parade, which was a very Mm. wonderful um, experience. It was something that like not a lot of groups always get to go to. I mean, timing wise, um, that was very, very wonderful. Um, there, oh, there's so many. And I mean, I felt like I was reliving it all because I, I did recently reread my book, which might sound silly, but it's been a while, guys. It's been a while. Um, I'm working on other stories. I had to refresh. Um, so there's so many things now that I'm like, Oh, but I loved that, like silly little memories where I'm like, oh, I miss the iced coffee there, you know, yeah. or like, oh gosh, like I miss, you know, eating the falafel. I miss foods. I, I'm a very, um, I love cooking. So I always think in, in terms of like the foods and the, and the memories that come with that. I made shakshuka the other morning and I was like, oh, I remember oh. eating this in Israel. <laughs> um, I also, we were just speaking about art. So I'm going to have to say at the Israel Museum, I loved so much. Uh, I was an art history minor in undergrad. We haven't actually talked about this. I went to NYU for undergrad. Oh, that's awesome. I, was, I will add that when I lived in Israel my first year, I was right out. I was right down the hill from the Israel Museum. And I would, it was open on Shabbat. And I would go every Shabbat. I would walk up there and walk around. So for an we went year, on Shabbat. Every, that was... Yeah, because you wouldn't have to pay or anything. So it was like, you could do it, mock me style. Yeah. You could do it observance style. So yeah, I would go every, go walk up and go and uh, oh, so I, I love the Israel. I loved it so it. much. I'm I'm one of those people who like, if I could just hang out in a museum, I will. Oh, gosh, yeah. I think we're being told to wrap it up. I think that's <laughs> happening. <laughs> it actually is indeed time for our Q&A. We have so many questions. <laughs> I'm hoping we'll be able to get through many of them. Um, it's funny because like, some of them have come up, like there was a question wondering about both of your favorite places in Israel. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's a great segue. Well, uh, we're ahead of the game. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's see here. Oh, so many good ones. Um, we do have someone who's wondering um, iced aroma iced coffee or lemonada. Mm-hmm. Wait, so which was the second That's one? Fun. Aroma versus Lemon, uh, aroma iced coffee or lemonana? I oh, I, you know, I'm I, aroma. Come on. <laughs> I was going to say aroma too. Like that was when I'm saying what I missed, I'm talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fun um, we do actually have, because you two are talking a bit about Saran already. Someone is wondering, would you ever have a bit of an origin or like standalone story featuring this character? Oh gosh. Um, you know what? I probably wouldn't because that's not my, my personal background and experience. I think uh, I would love to see a story featuring an Ethiopian Jewish character. That's not my background. So I, I probably wouldn't do it. I love her so much. If I can sneak her into another story, that would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, my second story has, um, I, I am trying to work in a little bit of a reference to uh, a couple of characters in there. So we'll see if I'm able to pull it off. So that's a little sneaky thing that I'm putting in there. They are unique characters. My second book is is a standalone. It's not a follow-up to this, um, but I they exist in the same universe. <laughs> awesome. 
so excited. I can't wait. I I'm I will pre-order it today, whether it's whether it's ready or not. Let me finish editing it. Jeez. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> Seriously, I've never cried so much in a book. It was all the feels. I loved it. So I will anything you put out there. <laughs> I will read your 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 trash edits, rough drafts, whatever you want, Haley. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Careful what you wish, wish for. I wish for it. <laughs> well, in thinking about, um, you know, the next projects that you have in the works, I don't know. Is the next book a YA novel as well? Okay, because we do have someone wondering here um, if you're hoping to continue writing for a YA, YA audience exclusively or if you're thinking of branching out um, into different genres. What okay, a question. Funny. You should think about rom-coms. Okay. You know what? This is so funny. Cause I was like vaguely working on a rom-com at one point, like yeah. about a year ago. And I got, I got distracted. <laughs> so I apologize to my agent. I started working on other things. Um, I, my background is in working with children and, uh, in, in education. With me. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's something where like, I would love to be writing in all areas of writing for children someday. Um, I did in grad school, I worked on projects like chapter books that I loved when I was teaching preschool, I actually was working on a set of stories and like maybe someday I'll revisit them that were um, reimagining reimaginings of Shakespearean plays in preschool classrooms. And I like actually yes. use them with my students and like maybe fingers crossed someday I'll revisit it. Um, I definitely am interested in middle grade right now. I can... Mm say that uh that's something very interesting to me um but <laughs> uh, as for rom-coms I mean oh gosh yeah I have this story that like maybe I'll get back to someday if I have enough confidence for it <laughs> but yes my next story is a young adult contemporary I can I can say that um it comes out next year I can uh I, we don't have an official synopsis yet but what I can say is I'm comping it to like Gilmore Girls but make it Jewish Ooh. Um, they, huh? with a main character who's like it's funny it's like her you and I against the world mother who, who's like kind of untraditional and this girl who's a little bit more straight laced and traditional, which is a fun dynamic to play with. Her mom's getting married and her mom says, I really hope you'll be involved in this. And the teenager hears I'm in charge of planning my mom's wedding. <laughs> so there's like wedding planning shenanigans. There's a lot about Vermont. There's a lot of Vermont setting in it. There's drama around a hub at one point. I'm exploring a bit of a friends to lovers plot line in it, maybe. Um, I am very excited to share it with everyone when it's in a shape to share. <laughs> We will be waiting. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Oh, so many good questions and we keep getting more. All right. Um, <laughs> we have one who's wondering, first of all, in all caps, I love this book so much. Thank you for sharing your heart with us. My book club has decided to make this our next group read because I was raving about it. What are some topics you would love a group of Jewish mothers to consider when we sit down together to discuss? Oh gosh, that's really, that is a really great topic for first of all I love book clubs I would like to just say like book clubs have helped me through the pandemic so much I'm in two right now that mean the world to me I'm uh, in one with some of my grad school friends and just being able to like chat about books and see each other means the world um, and I'm also in uh, a Teach for America uh, alumni. It's called a Prism Prism Group. Uh, so we read a lot of queer stories, and I love it so much. So first of all, shout out to book clubs. Love them, love them, love them. Thank you for picking my book. Oh my gosh, like that. That's an honor. Um, one thing to talk about. I mean, there. Oh gosh, that's such a oh, that's such a tough question. I would probably. I mean, I think talking about the Jewish identity, so a group of Jewish moms talking about the different forms of Jewish identity would would probably be an interesting thing to explore um, because that was very purposeful, thinking about how the, the kids are connecting to it in different ways. Um, you know, they're all teenagers in this story and that's such a, a purposeful kind of uh, time, right? That's such a purposeful like 
how, it's very purposeful how they're going to be connecting to their identity. So, so talking about identity, um, kind of talking about uh, themes of, of grief and how, um, how the lighthearted and the dark moments kind of come together. That's an interesting thing to explore, especially like to talk about your personal connections. Uh, I always end up like finding myself sharing things in, in a book club. So, you know, being able to talk about your own personal connections, if you do have, you know, memories of Israel, like taking that as a moment to share or just, you know, talking about how you connected to your, your own identity. Tally's figuring it out. What was it like when you were figuring it out? Oh gosh, being put on the spot. I'm all like, <sighs> but thank you. Absolute honor. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. We've got um, someone who's wondering in terms of other issues, because there are so many important issues that you touch on in this book. And they're wondering, can you see yourselves delving into other serious issues too within the Jewish faith, for instance, such as anti-Semitism? Yeah. Yeah. So th thank you for asking that. Um, anti-Semitism is touched upon in this. There, there is a scene where the characters are discussing um, moments they've had interactions with anti-Semitism. And one moment in particular, I, I did borrow from my own <laughs> my own background of um, being at a at a, a party and someone offhand saying like, oh, like, can you go get the cookies out of the oven? Like, oh, your people are real familiar with ovens, aren't they? And like, that was a real thing that happened. And it's small moments like that, right? <laughs> That's, it's, it, every day, like it happens every day and it happens in ways that people just, just don't expect and don't think of. I 100% have been thinking about exploring that more, um, maybe less so in my, in my next book coming up, but um, I'm definitely, so I, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely interested in that. <laughs> it's something to explore. Um, one thing in particular that I haven't seen a lot is anti-Semitism around um, fi financial backgrounds, different financial backgrounds, because there's such an assumption of like, oh, well, if you're Jewish, you're, you're well off or you're this way. Like, oh, Jews are so familiar with money or comfortable with money. Um, I remember when I was growing up, there was a t-shirt from Urban Outfitters that said, everyone loves a Jewish girl with money on it. Um, yeah, that's a real thing that happened. Um, so that's something I'm really interested in exploring because you know, that's not how life looks. That's not, that's not the truth. And people will say like, oh, well, why do you think that's such a big issue? Shouldn't you take that like Shouldn't it be nice that we assume that of you? Isn't that a good, a good assumption? So that's something I'm interested in exploring in future works. Um, <laughs> but there, but there is a discussion in in this book uh, about anti-Semitism, um, and yeah, it, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, at, at this point, like you know, I know Jewish writers who get very, very fearful of talking about their identities. You know, I, I know even, and this might be a silly example, I. I remember I have a, a friend who is writing and, and there was a discussion of anti-Semitism in her work. And I was really, I was stressed for her. Like I was stressed because I was like, I was worried that people wouldn't recognize it as, as anti-Semitism or like, oh, why did the characters react this way? And I was coming from this place of like fear. Like I, I'm worried about people being, being terrible to you because you're writing about this. And I don't know, I guess my, my hope and dream is that we can get to a point where we can discuss this and where more people are discussing this. And I guess it all starts with, it all starts with the writing, doesn't it? Oof, yeah, emotional topic, but yes, definitely. I am interested in exploring it more and it is explored here. A lot of times those little moments, because that is what's so realistic, those matter a lot like you said it starts with the writing and and then we're reading it and becoming familiar and eyes are opening yeah. or things are resonating um that's why it's so important to read yeah. diverse books like read a wide set of books please like don't just read from your background just read 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 because there's so many different perspectives and backgrounds and and you're not gonna know everything so read like consume different forms of media just like go have fun <laughs> 
Well, speaking of having fun and different forms of media and writing, we have actually now had at least two different questions about the two of you potentially collaborating either on book or film. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> you know what? Never, you never, you never, you never ever know what could happen. But I mean, I'm a huge fan of Haley and I'll read I'm a big fan right. of yours. I mean, I, I know it's a mutual yes, love. Um, you know, I think I think we both plan to just keep doing good work going forward, and we'll see what happens. Ooh. My goodness, so many questions, and of course, I'm looking at the clock. And, oh, just a couple minutes left. Um, we do have one here wondering about your favorite scene to write in the book. I feel like that's a happy Ooh. question. Hopefully. Favorite scene to write? Oh, if I can tell you my least favorite scene. Um. <laughs> it's actually a question for that sort of too, like the hardest scene to write. Oh, okay. I can answer that quickly. Um, we've touched upon it a little. There is a, a twist in the story and we're not going to say what it is because go read the book. Um, that was not in the original first draft or, or at least not um, as heavily as it was. It came out as I was writing an argument between two of the characters and one of the characters sort of revealed this thing. I sound like such a writer saying this, like, oh, what, what do you mean? This is what's been going on this whole time. Um, th what is now the reveal part? What is now the, the section that you get to and you'll know it when you get to it. Um, I sobbed every time like not even a joke I sobbed every time working on that I just like uh my friend recently sent me picture proof of me crying in a Panera pre-pandemic uh while I was working on it like hey you remember, remember when you got mad at yourself from your own writing like oops <laughs> I guess that happened um yeah that that was probably the hardest, which is most emotional part to work on because I just, every time I was writing it, I felt like I was living through it with the character. Um, and I, again, I said, I recently reread this. I cried again. I just apparently can keep making myself cry. Um, the best part to write. Oh, I don't know so much of it. I loved so much of it. I think I loved, I love writing David a lot. Like he's such a dork for those who have read, he's such a dorky character and all of his like silly little things he goes off on. I, I love that. I love the kind of dialogue I got to write around it. Um, I'm a very like silly person myself. Um, so the, the joking around those like playful light moments, I loved writing Joshua and Gabriel, like they're my chaotic children. <laughs> I loved writing Saran, like she is so like, powerful and wonderful all of her uh, art rants were a hundred percent inspired by like rants I used to go on as an art history minor so like I loved being able to just like, dump that on the page so they're just I, I loved the characters interacting and being silly because that brought me so much joy like when when you're laughing reading it I was probably laughing writing it um, and if you're crying reading it I was probably crying writing it <laughs> feel like it's the best kind of book quite oh. frankly <laughs> and it's actually time to end I think that's a pretty wonderful note to end on um, I'm sorry for the people whose questions we missed but thank you I for asking them. like <sighs> I know there are so many interesting ones I'm looking through like no are we sure this is it is over at nine <laughs> But, but thank you all so much. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us, Haley and Jean. Thank you all for contributing your questions and your time tonight. I'm so truly so happy you were here to spend the evening with our Booksmith community. Um, and for those of you who haven't already uh, purchased a copy that is signed and will be personalized if you wish, I'm by going the author. tomorrow, I'm signing <laughs> them. You can do so. I have the link here in the chat. Um, go right to that page and just make sure you note who you would like it made up to. <laughs> so thank you all. I hope to see you at future events, maybe for a future event with Haley and Jean, <laughs> collaboration or otherwise. <laughs> Definitely. I'm always around. <laughs> oh, congratulations gosh. again. It's such a good book. And I really hope everyone enjoys it as much as I did. I know they will. 
Oh, Jean, thank you for being here. Rachel, thank you so much for running this. And just everyone, everyone, thank you. This has been such a joy. And I'm I'm really happy I got to I got to share it. It was our pleasure. Thank you all 